master of data science. Oh, there we go. Uh, so for the recording, welcome to Teresa Anderson, who is back here uh, after having a distinguished career here at UTS as an academic. Her expertise goes way back before anybody was really talking about ethics and data and AI in the mainstream as a social informaticist. Um, she did amazing work here at UTS, especially encouraging women to come into data science. Um, and many of you also know her through government and her industry contacts as well. So I don't want to take any more time. I want to hand over to Teresa. Welcome to the online people as well. This is being recorded. Um, and Teresa will be uh, opening up for conversation at different points as well for, uh, for feedback. So Teresa, over to you. And let's welcome Teresa Anderson. Thank you, Simon, for that uh, wonderful welcome. It's so exciting to be back. Um, still a little surreal to be here, not as a UTS academic, but as a scholar working in my own business. But I'm thrilled to see my many past lives join with my present. Uh, and to be celebrating 10 years this month that we were first working in KIC and um, developing the Master of Data Science. And notice how students, they still gather together. So, you know, it's just, it's a marvelous community. Uh, so I'm just, you know, me in tech. Let's see, okay, I can look there. I wanted to begin by paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are meeting. So here where we are sitting right now, this is Gadigal country, uh, and pay my respects to any First Nations people who are present or listening to the live recording or will be listening to the recording at some later stage. But I also want to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional custodians of the lands on which I am now working. I live now in the southwest corner of this continent in a magical place that is Noongar country uh, on the edges of, of an estuary known as Dorwal Elap that itself is only 7,000 years old. You can see it here. But the country uh, and the community, the Noongar who are there have been there for over 45,000 years. And this particular sculpture I love, this is this I see when I go down to the water in the morning and it greets you and it's called Heart and Home and it's been created by a, a studio of indigenous designers who work um, and collaborate with members of the community from all different histories and from all different talents and capacities. And this idea of heart and home and a connection and a respect for land is a message that I like to think underpins what I'm going to talk to you about today, because I think if we're going to be ethical, let's just see if the machine does what I want it to do. Am I not pointing it in the right place? Maybe I have to use, there we go. So that's just a statement, an artist statement from the designers sharing a little bit about their intention with that work. And as people who have worked with me in the past will appreciate, an ecological perspective is very much at the heart of what I'm doing. And so much what I'm seeking to do right now is not just about uh, enabling us to recognize the human in our relationship with machines, but also to appreciate that what, what I feel we need to be doing as a planet is look for ways to support human and planetary flourishing. So I have this daily reminder when I'm down there and I'm surrounded by people who celebrate that magnificent country and all the dynamics that the earth gives us. So I just wanted to start with that. And to begin with what I'm going to share um, before I, I offer you, I'm road testing my, my seven actions for now for transforming um, ethical intention into action. But I thought I'd start by just sharing some of the red threads of my ethically reflective practice, which goes back, it, uh, you know, as Simon said, that, you know, I really appreciate that it predates, predates my work as a data science educator. Um, I might say it, you know, I roamed with the dinosaurs, I think someone once said um, in IT here at UTS, because my staff number was so old, it didn't exist in some of the spreadsheets. And I thought, well, I know I'm not the oldest staff member here, but I was here at, in a sense, the dawn of the digital. So that makes me so last century. Uh, back in the 1980s, when I was an undergrad, this statement from John Nesbitt about the future was something that was really, for, for me, it really spoke to something in my heart about how even if you're looking at technology, 
it's really the issues about humans that and our how we feel about ourselves and the concept of what it means to be human that that will shape our future. At the time, I was not working in information science. I was working in political analysis and nuclear strategy. And again, that was a human technology consideration of a whole nother level. But I think um, given what we as a planet have been through in terms of COVID and in terms of the challenges of climate change and the climate crisis and political crises globally, I think that expanding concept of what it means to be human resonates really strongly now. See if it, but it behaves. See, I know. See, when I talk about machines, they don't like me. So here we go. So the other statement that that I feel um, resonates with me very deeply, and and this essay by Vannevar Bush inspired my thesis as I transitioned from working in nuclear strategy into information systems and understanding um, human engagements with information and data. And again. The, lecture in, the lecturer in me comes out and I start thinking, well, you know, when you've read this essay, um, if you have never read it, please, I, I welcome your thoughts on this. But imagining this being written in 1945 at the dawn of the nuclear age. So I can't get my head past that understanding of context as Bush wrote this. And much is made of how Vannevar Bush's essay inspired hypertext because he imagined he created little versions of the memex that led to hypertext and um, Berners-Lee is said to have read it and, and um, been prompted to play as he did with what became the World Wide Web. Um, whether that's mythology or not, it's still when you read that essay, you see this imagining of, you know, how could we help humans to be able to grasp all that has been written before in a way that will help them to solve problems faster. And so a lot is made of the fact that, oh, well, you know, yes, you know, we can replace humans with these, these machine tools that will help define information. But what he actually says, and I've always loved this part of, of that section of his essay, that yes, you know, you, you put all this material together, put it in the machine, let the machine ingest it. But for mature thought, there is no mechanical substitute. So I do not see it as the old either or. It's not machine or human. It's about imagining a way that machines can help us to be free to be human. But that means we have to think about what we mean by being human. So that gave me the start of what was my thesis, the reason that I studied information science and looked at information retrieval. And I'm not expecting anyone to memorize or even know this calculation but I was trying to understand how people come to know that they have found what they are looking for when they're dealing with networked information systems. And again, I was very lucky that at the moment I was asking this question, we were just moving into a phase where you could actually, as a user, interface directly with a networked information system. You didn't need to be mediated by an expert who dealt with that content. But how do you do that then when you have all this? And I was, I witnessed for two and a half years, I, I followed um, scholars who were breaking new grounds in their field. They were um, in the midst of paradigm shifts. And that makes it really challenging to work with systems. I had one encounter where one of my scholars just grabbed the computer just gently around the side and said, I know it's in there. I just have to find it, you know? So that was a very interesting human machine encounter. But what I, the reason that I pursued my question the way that I did is because this side, and for the benefit of the tape, I'm pointing to the left-hand side, the machine perspective. When I started in information retrieval, our understanding of relevance and uncertainty for human decision-making was a mathematical calculation. And the reason I got into my thesis the way that it was is, and I'll quote Jerry Seinfeld, not that there's anything wrong with this mathematical con calculation. It was fantastic. It helped to design the system. But I was struggling as a user to get the systems to give me what it was that I was looking for. And I thought I can't be the only one. And that led me to start to take this anthropological exploration of human decision-making and find a way to connect it and find those intersection points with the mathematical. And that remains the pursuit that I have, even though I no longer um, focus specifically on relevance. But what it did also lead to is one of the first of my, um, for my career defining frameworks, which was the phase states of creativity and innovation, and looking at the different ways that human and machine could come together when examining information and 
you know, you could argue data as well, that plan and pressure aspects of this are privileged in the ways that we work with systems and frankly, the way we work in organizations because we have structure, we have shape. Um, I've studied creatives as well. And it's the same, even if you're not defined by that. You know, pressure can give you a deadline, which is good. I have a time constraint, which reminds me, please, Simon, keep me from ranging so far that uh, the room leaves and I'm only halfway through, but we'll see how we go. But that, so that pressure is beneficial, but it can also be too much. We can reach the breaking point. What I've witnessed through the work that I've done as an educator, as a researcher, and as a practitioner is that we need more space for play and for pause. And the play is where when I studied relevance, I also ventured into uncertainty. And uncertainty is such a wonderful human notion, a delightfully human notion, that we need to be able to have time to privilege. And sitting in uncertainty can be incredibly powerful, but it's very hard to sit in uncertainty when you have a plan and you're trying to know, and so many of our systems seek to push us that way. So again, beneficial to have, but we need to be minded as organizations, as societies, and at a metacognitive level as individuals about how and where we do our best thinking. So that led me to doing installation work and being a creative in the midst of information science, um, community engagements and organizations to try to help others to be thinking about, as John Halkins said, where do you want to think? Not what do you want to think, but where do you do your best thinking? How do you do your best thinking? And what do you need to do individually and collectively to enable that? And I think given that we as a society and certainly as a country have a mental health crisis and we have a struggle with trying to understand how to make sure that we can look after ourselves and our communities, that seems an important question given that we are a knowledge industry or a knowledge community. How do we, how do we deal with that? So, so playing with that, um, Simon, as my boss in Kick, um, I was so grateful. We actually had a room that we could give over to play and pause, and you know, we had our little contemplative space. Um, so, you know, it's just we just need time for ourselves sometimes. So again, I'll get carried away on that, and I'm mindful of the time, but that is a red thread that carries on throughout. That idea of the fast and the slow and needing to, um, at this very moment, I would argue, particularly now as we're dealing with AI tools that can actually speed the process. There's nothing wrong with those, but what do we need for ourselves as well? And then another thread that you'll see very much present in my work is this idea of making the invisible visible. And the very first conversation that Simon and I had at UTS was sharing our, our um, appreciation of Jeff Balker and Lee Starr and their work. And this notion of, you know, raw data is an oxymoron. It has to be cooked with care. Talking with Jeff when he came here to speak to our students and then taking him to dinner, sitting around a lovely meal and having time together led to what became the MasterChef digital data mystery box. Um, and cooking with care. So, so, you know, it's people that give you these ideas for working with data. And once I left UTS and the Master of Data Science, I then had the opportunity to be part of the formative group that started working on AI assurance for the New South Wales government. And I also had the opportunity, I had um, support from New South Wales government to sit in some of the ideas that I had been looking at and seeking to bring into the Master of Data Science and do it in a way that would, would try to understand the engagement between people and data in the design of AI and automated decision-making systems, but through a socio-technical lens, one that appreciated that complexity, but still helped people to try to, to frame a way forward. And so you can tell I like fours. I like that poetry, plan, pressure, play, pause. So in this case, it was data, design, people, and policy. So data and design, to me, are, are shaped by an organizational context. So there is more control that individuals within an organization will have to determine what is data, to think about how to design that system in, in representing data and working with data. But people and policy are what create the context, the important context for actually moving forward with that. And, and the challenges of society and the challenges of the structures of legislation and regulation and, and wider cultural policy, these are factors that exist outside the organizational context but influence it very much and there's an interplay. 
And I wanted a fractal view of that because it's not an either or, it's not something where you can say there's a category that will say this is in and this is out. There is at any one point, there is a recognition that some of this is more in and some of it is more out. But as you move further and further out my fractal, what you end up getting are those, those big notions of representation and infrastructure and society that, that play into how it is that we are and we, we remain human and they shape what it is that we are doing individually and collectively to design these tools. So the key lessons that came out of that work that I seek to bring into the work that I've been doing um, locally and internationally is to recognize that how important it is to show your hand. Again, training as an ethnographer and recognizing that when you story this and you provide evidence, you make sure you keep that audit trail. You, you trace your process and you remain open to um, recognition and learning that something that you have assumed is not necessarily the way that others see it and that there's maybe a, a different way forward. There's also this respect that you have to give to the connection between what you have collected and what you analyze and what you report. So to, so to respect that, but to also appreciate that that is perhaps partial knowledge. To use these criteria of soundness, I do a lot of work in trust. You know, how you demonstrate trust is by first practicing and developing credibility and being transparent. Um, and that trust building really makes a difference when you're working with data and working with people. So a lot of what I'm doing now is really about trying to create what I shorthand as um, a compassionate data science, a way of creating a culture of care that is not, is not something we see as outside our work with data, outside our work with systems, but rather this is our way of being human in the midst of doing all of this design and development work. And so I seek to build a culture of care where creation, compassion, contemplation, and connection are our, our modus operandi. So you're building all these amazing technical capacities, you're working on this technical know-how, but you're also allowing time to be human, which I would argue, again, looking back at how I worked um, and, and the, the study that I did in information science and on human decisioning, it's making space for imagination and problem finding so being able to sit and think about what is it that I want to work on, that has to be nurtured alongside our technical know-how. And so that led to an invitation by IEEE's Technology and Society magazine to share what I thought my view of a compassionate AI future would look like. And I'm, you know, I took, I said seven because I had just finished reading Seven Lessons um, in, in Physics by Ravelli, and I love the idea of seven, and, you know, and being constrained by seven. If it had been five, it might have been harder. If it was 10, I would have had too many. But seven felt like a lovely magical number. And so I had these seven lessons, and I, I'll share, um, again, an old academic is never, you know, you, what you fade away, but you never die. So I, I have slides that I'll share and I have the links to some of this work in there. So I'd love your feedback about this. Um, and that, that essay, that's the other thing when you're a scholar and no longer um, an academic, you don't worry about points. So now I write essays, I just write those out. So in this particular essay, these, these seven um, lessons now serve as the fulcrum for a book that I'm working on that talks about how to articulate the, uh, I'll put that on the next one, the elements that have shaped my own ethical reflective practice and have shaped the training that I have done for students and for industry to be ethically reflective. And then the last section is what I'm going to share with you right now, which are the seven actions that I think you can walk out of this room and do to start moving towards being um, deliberately, you know, not just intentionally ethical, but putting that into action. And so that's where I want to go now and sort of spend that time uh, sort of sharing these seven. And I, I would love to stop at the end of each and, and have, have a moment for some conversation, but if you don't mind saving the big, um, deep engagements for the end so that we can take it over to lunch afterwards. I'm sorry, people listening in the recording, you'll have to have your lunch separate, but you know, reach out to me and we'll do something virtual. Uh, 
and I want to say here, so, so I've explained why the seven. I want to also say what I mean by ethics and the ethical. So I work in standards and I work with regulation and I, and I, and I work on policy. And those are all driven by my, you know, my personal motivation in there is driven by my personal ethics. And I know and I have the highest regard for the people I work with who are all ethically reflective in their own way and seek to bring that to their work. But what I would also like to say is that developing those tools and those policies is in and of itself not how you are ethical. Because to me, being ethical is measured not by how well you follow regulation or not by how much you are adhering to a standard. Again, those are all very important and they can be an aspect of your ethical practice. But if you're following regulation, you're abiding by the law. And if you're following a standard in an industry and an organization, you are demonstrating your professionalism. Ethics and the measure of your ethical response is determined by how you handle the unknown, by how you handle the gray and the abstract and the murky. And again, it's not an either or, but I think that's something that worries me at the moment that so often I'm hearing people talk about being ethical by following these rules. And that's great, that can be a part of their ethics. But ethics is really when we are handed, and this happens in technology all the time, the human technology relationship is ever exploding and ever expanding. So the rules that were created yesterday are not necessarily going to, and we've seen that play out all the time. It doesn't drive, it, you can get away with following the law and still being unethical. So that's why we need to stand up and to find ways as individuals to articulate for ourselves and for our community what we mean by ethical and how we can transform that into action. So, so I've said that, we're shaping the good. You know, I sought to do that myself when we were designing the Master of Data Science and Innovation and we sought to be human-centered. We sought to bring an ethical mindset, an ethical lens to that. There wasn't a class called ethics for that very specific reason, because ethics was the mindset, the thinking that you brought to it. And so it goes back. I love this, this idea that, well, can we code human values into AI? We certainly are trying, but again, given the dynamics, I, I question that. I think we focus on building very good AI the good of being a human relates to us actually allowing ourselves to be human. And so often, just drawing on this um, English translation of, of Aristotle, um, all knowledge and every pursuit aims at some good. Most of us are talking about doing good and being good. What then do we mean by good? And that's where we have to take time individually and collectively to articulate that, to evidence that. And it starts with metacognitive appreciation of your own thinking, sitting in that thinking and sitting in the unknowns and thinking about what it is it means for you. I would argue, and that's what I'd love to talk about, is that that's how we practice compassionate data science. And we can start to do that by laying this foundation for responsible use and responsible design of data and AI systems by making the time to think and reflect about what we value and what we want to see in our communities and in our planet to connect with community so that it isn't just us. We're not just designing for us. We're trying to understand the R, the we, and to also make the time to build trusted relationships. You don't just walk into a space and have trust. You can very quickly lose it, but it is an ongoing and a very important treasured process. So I'm gonna share some of my first ones and I smile because I love telling this story. Some of you, I apologize, will have heard me share this before, um, but it's an important way to acknowledge my own family history. And I think the gift that I was given in terms of appreciating the fluidity of boundaries and how that has shaped my own mindset and what I think I've come to feel, I'm happy to be challenged on that, is a really important aspect of our work with technology and data and structure. And that is, our first action walking out of here, we can develop an appreciation for the fluidity of boundaries. And I'll illustrate that with a little story from this, the largest city near the lands where my parents come from. So this is the city of Passau, which sits at the moment in the country of Germany and is on the edge of Austria and what is now known as Czechia. And it is the place, it is the largest city near where my family come from. They, my father's family 
uh, one strand come from the upper rivers of the Inn, which is the green, you can't quite tell, but it's the green glacial as a truck goes by in the back. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, it floods. Yeah, absolutely. So just recently, all of this was under. So what you have at the top is the green glacial water of the Inn. And the Inn comes down from the Austrian Alps. And this middle one is the Blue Danube. It's not usually blue when I see it. It's a very murky kind of bluish. And it comes from the forests on the western side of Germany, closer to France. And this very, very deep tannic black river down at the bottom of the picture is the Ilts, which comes out of the Bohemian forest, where another part of my family come from. So what is now known as uh, Czechia, or the Czech Republic is over here on the lower left side of this picture. Austria is the land at the top, and the city itself, as I said, jurisdictionally is in Germany. But as a child, I used to be fascinated going here and going down to the river. And I don't know if it comes through on the picture, but you can see a little bit of the marbling. And I used to, we would go on a boat and you, you can go to a point where the three rivers meet. And I'd sit, I put my hand in there and I think, am I in the Inn? Am I in the Danube? Am I in the Ilts? You know, you could start. It was clearly defined down here. This is mapped and it lists, it's listed as the Ilts, the Danube and the Inn. But you go to this marbling and your hand is in here, you know, and there are molecules in there that supposedly a moment ago were the Inn. And there are molecules in there that were in the Ilts. And now all of a sudden, and this is the interesting thing, because from my eye, when I was a child, the Inn was the bigger river. But from this point onwards, this is the Danube. And the Danube flows to the Black Sea. So what fascinated me, and I use this metaphor when we talk about data as water. So it's now the Danube in all your databases and your documentation, it would be the Danube from henceforth. But the molecules that are in there have a story to tell, bringing glacial water from up in the Austrian Alps in the Inn. They haven't disappeared, they've just been renamed. And I think it's important for us to appreciate that that boundary um, is, is defined by context, but it is not necessarily containing all the knowledge and all that we could know. So I'll behave myself because I don't want to carry on the whole, whole time on that. And I want to um, hear your thoughts on this. But certainly when I was working in information science and I was teaching classification, I really appreciated the work of Bowker and Starr who presented an, what at that time was an alternative position on classification, which was that classification is theoretical and classification is shaped by your world. And so certainly when you're working with designing indexing systems, which I was, or classification, that, that's, that's an important ethical consideration. So I just pulled this little quote out, that it is politically and ethically crucial to recognize the vital role that infrastructure plays. And this idea that what we seek to do, what we should be seeking to do is produce some form of flexible system because we need to recognize structure helps us. Knowing, knowing that there is a river named the Danube is important for being able to identify and to know what is river and what is not. If I can play with that metaphor a little bit. But we also need to find a way to acknowledge the traces of what came before so that that doesn't get completely lost or subsumed. And that becomes very important when we're dealing with people who are represented in data, because we know that so often people get lost in that because they aren't the prevailing view or because they are considered somehow subordinate. And so there is power in that. And I know this, I felt this as a, in my family. So that photo up at the top, that is um, what is technically the border between East and West Europe. It was also what ended up being the divide that and compelled my family to move because the mountain that my family is associated with, one side was Eastern Europe and one side was Western Europe. But certainly before that was labeled such, it was just a mountain and communities worked and lived and walked there. Naming matters and categorization matters. And I love this, this work by Mary Ellen Kapek that language is one of the most intimate and most political of human activities. So sometimes, and um, I've had conversations with people about you know, why we're focusing so much on language and so much on naming. It's, 
It's important because sometimes what we name things then constrains our thinking about things. Naming is important because we have a compulsion when we are working with technology, we have to create these categories, we have to make these distinctions. And what I guess I'm just suggesting is that we, we need to also find ways to acknowledge that, that at a moment in time that category is effective, but what can we do to build that, uh, uh, an appreciation and a respect for that fluidity and flexibility? So I love to quote you, Simon, on this. So this idea, this is specifically about um, learning analytics, but I love this idea that data points in a graph are just tiny portholes. So they represent, but they're not a complete representation. And we need to recognize and appreciate that the fullness of life, just like the full story of those rivers, won't be told necessarily by the name or the label that we have given them. Who we are, where we are, and what we are is not always going to fully correspond with where we or our ideas are placed in a system. And again, it's not that we don't use those systems, but remaining minded about that is the starting point, I would suggest, for finding ways to make sure that we are respecting people who aren't necessarily in those systems or ideas that are not fully represented or appreciated in the systems that we're creating. So, Give, give me a pause and I, I invite any observation or comment. I mean, I, I, I see a few nodding heads, so that's encouraging. Um, any, any thoughts anyone wants to share about the fluidity of boundaries? Yeah. Yes. So I'll repeat that. Sorry, I should, for the benefit of the tape, as they say. So, so the current front page news around the APS census and how how data will be collected and how people will be represented in that. So social data is particularly profound. And in a case of the ABS, thinking about how that is then used to determine policy or determine you know, what a community needs based on this, on this calculation. It also flags, thank you, it's a, a great observation because it flags the challenge around longitudinal data because to be able to link and to develop the, um, gain the benefits of having big data that's collected over time and, and, and through different situations, having some form of consistency is really beneficial. The challenge is we can get so easily seduced into thinking that that is everything. Um, and I know my MDSI students would have experienced some of that, you know, and the struggle and the pain. They're not alone. I'm not singling you, you guys out. But, you know, how do we do that? And, you know, thinking, thinking about some of the conversations that, that Suhan and I had when we were first talking about how do, you, how do you work with linked data systems and you deal with that difference. So, Simon. Just wondering, do you have a favorite example about boundary fluidity when it comes to data? I'm not sure that uh, it's like choosing children, but I think as a, as a general rule, what, what I like are those, those systems that um, make very clear how they've collected so that, so that, and I'm, tr I'm trying to think I've seen, I've seen this in the small, I can't say that I've seen it in large organizations. And I think it's in part that challenge of um, being clear on your definitions to begin with and working through. What I have seen used really well um, are sort of the alternative tools. So having, having metadata that is respected so that within the metadata, you're able to give different lenses and different contexts so that you can then link. So you might have the formalized categories that you need to adhere to policy. This is again, one of those where there are certain um, regulatory requirements that say we have to collect certain things um, and you might have to adhere to that. But then through some of the, the rich um, annotation and notation um, elements of data collection, it is possible to collect more story. And then going alongside that, it's not important to just collect that at that metadata level, but find ways to make sure that you make that visible and you help people to know how it is that they might be able to use that. And the other thing that I have found that I think um, helps deal with that fluidity is the, is, um, 
shortening the, the period of time with, uh, between design iterations so that you have the opportunity to reflect on what might need to be added or, or also how something should be collected. So sometimes it isn't necessarily the category, but it's, it's how, how the categorization is interpreted. And then also, and perhaps the, the biggest benefit I think goes to something I'll talk about in one of the other um, actions is allowing mechanisms for feedback so that you make sure in a trusted environment, you can get um, genuine and authentic uh, insight from people who feel that it's either biased in one way or the other, and then engage. It doesn't mean you change it, but you engage in the discussion about how do we deal with this? So is there a follow on there? Sorry. I'm just gonna say I've got a concrete example, which is that there are over a hundred different ways that the government classifies the geography of New South Wales and they make sense for the different purposes for which they were created, right? So Department of Health thinks about local health districts. That makes sense because that's how they organise themselves. Other parts of government think about um, local government areas, but there are so many different ways, all of which have been designed for a good and cogent reason, but it makes it really hard to think about it if you want to convert between one and the other or if you want to see the implications of one on the other. So I think that one, if you just think about it almost literally as a boundary, like a geography boundary, might make it real. And I'll, I'll get to Chelsea. I just wanted to say thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent example and, a, and an argument for building in pauses and perhaps also inviting a little bit of serendipity and uncertainty discovery by saying you're, you're can you imagine a machine? This was my fantasy. And if there's anyone looking for a postdoc, please, please talk to me and we'll think about funding. A serendipity or an uncertainty engine that would say, I notice, you know, like the old paperclip in Microsoft, I notice you're doing a lot using this system. Have you thought about, you know, can you see this? And it may not necessarily work, but just being able to sit with that, come from another perspective and see. But to be able to do that in an organization, there has to be sufficient recognition that maybe the timeline needs to be changed a little bit, or we need to allow for some experimentation. So that goes, again, building on your question, Simon, it's sometimes not the structure, but the process around the structure that can make a difference. Jazia. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate this discussion. And I think you, so uh, I just wanted to mention that, like, we talk about regulation and following regulations, but often technology moves faster than the regulation. So we end up seeing lots of things that are available and you can use them and the regulation doesn't cover them yet. And it's being able to have that, um, you know, that um, top of mind of how does that impact people? Um, can I use it that way, even if it's not covered by the really, it's that honesty and that transparency. I just wanted to mention that I'm um, very uh, fortunate to work for a, a company that actually cares about these things. What we do is that we say, does the work you do pass the pub test? And the pus, pub test is about like, if you go out in the pub and you talk to people and tell them, what are you working on? And yeah, I'm collecting these data and I'm like measuring this and doing that would they find that creepy? Would it pass the pub test? Could you talk about it comfortably with everyone and say, this is what I'm doing with the data? If it doesn't the pub test, don't do it. So that's what we try to do. I thank you. I, I appreciate the you know flagging from, from the practice standpoint, just how difficult it is sometimes when technology is going faster than the rules. And that is that is so common. That's where opportunity lies, but it's also where some of the really dodgy things happen. So I know we used to play with, I think, Pash, we had some games, cool or creepy. You know, is this a cool use of the tool or is it creepy? The challenge there too is it's contextual. What for one person is really cool for another just freaks them out because of situations. And that's where, again, those mechanisms for feedback are so important. And I would argue bringing participation um, front and center. So one, I, I, you know, as often happens, it's easier to see what is what you don't like <laughs> than it is what you like. One of the frustrations I have, and I work, I was the editor on a standard, an international standard for data sharing and use. And, and you know, I, I love, I feel very privileged to have been able to work on that and work internationally with that community. But there's a, in so many ways, what we ended up publishing is, is already going to be outdated. So you try to, you try to find high principles. You try, you try to say, here's the principled approach. 
and, and new practices can relate to that. One of the worries I have sometimes when I talk to organizations and they're so focused, particularly when dealing with AI that relates to social data, they're so concerned about making sure that they adhere to regulations and that they have articulated policies. And that's really good. You know, I don't want to work with someone who doesn't want to do that. But it sometimes comes at the expense of actually engaging with the practitioners on the ground who have real problems to solve. And I'd like to find a way that we can do both. But from a resource perspective, often it's an either or. And organizations from an insurance and compliance standpoint sometimes feel like they have to privilege that regulation. Um, anyway, we could go on all day on that one, but we'll thank you for, for sharing that. So I'm going to move on, not because there's not more to say, but because there are some others uh, that I want to share with you. So the second one that I think is a really important one, um, and again, I, I don't know that I have them, you know, certainly the boundaries one is one of my favorites, so that goes number one, and uncertainty is number two. The order uh, in which these are presented, uh, yeah, it, we'll see. It depends what day of the week it is sometimes as to what order I'd like to present them, but I Embracing the opportunities on, in uncertainty to me is another really critical one for helping us as individuals and organizations to think about ways to move forward in an ethical and an ethically intended way. So going to the idea of things move fast. Well, how do I learn to deal with that to settle? So uncertainty can be very unsettling, um, but if we can learn to embrace the benefits in that, then it can also serve as a signal for how we might innovate and affect change. So we used to say in, in the Master of Data Science and Innovation that uncertainty is like a white knuckle ride. And this is one of my favorite illustrations of this, this windsurfer you know, going through the wind and anyone who does adventure sports, you sort of think, okay, there's that moment where you fear for your life because you're not quite sure that this is gonna go as planned. But if you can, if you can ride that well enough, it becomes a joyous experience. But there's no guarantee that the second time it will be the same. And I say that as a woman who stands here with an artificial knee because you know I had one of those adventure rides that just didn't quite go according to plan. Um, I lived, fortunately, <laughs> but it, 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 it raises that awareness that there are situations where there's too much uncertainty. But I think if we can, if we can find ways to embrace it, that is certainly what I've been working on with my phase states of creativity and uncertainty. And there in the majority of what I'm talking about is dealing with um, intellectual uncertainty, but it's also about experiencing uncertainty as a lived, you know, a lived way of being. So, so thinking about how you can disrupt plan and disrupt structure individually and collectively. And I think that's important because there is no, like we were just saying, Josia, you know, regulations don't always keep up with everything. And there is no universality that we can um, draw on that will say these are the truths that will always be with us. So there is that dynamics we have to appreciate. And I remember years ago, um, in the midst of the horrific bushfires on the East Coast in 2019 to 20, well, 2018, 2019, um, hearing an interview with someone who was trying to work with data to understand fire behavior. And they were saying, well, you know, the data is never going to be complete. The information is never going to be certain, but we still have to take action. And that, that is that moment of uncertainty where you, when you develop the capacity to be able to sit in that and have some tools available for working with it. That's how you can move forward more confidently with the information that's there, but also remain sufficiently respectful of the fact that there are unknowns. And as those unknowns might or might not reveal themselves, it becomes possible to change direction instead of saying, oh no, but you know, we made this decision. And I think I, I would argue that one of the best, most effective ways to help us to navigate that uncertainty is by finding ways to um, build communities where there's honest and open sharing in a trusted framework. So it's very hard for us to reveal our weaknesses and our uncertainties if we feel they're gonna be used against us. 
when you can build a community space, when you can build a team where, where you've actually been able to demonstrate that, that you do genuinely want authentic, honest feedback, when you can build that trusted space within which someone can tell you when they have doubt without it being held against them, then you come to powerful conversations about the benefits of exploring the unknown and exploring the uncertain. So I played with this idea of, you know, sharing uncertainty. And that certainly has come through a lot of the work that I've done um, in, in the field, sort of seeing the benefits of being able to share, not just scholars, but data practitioners as well. So when you can see that uncertainty as a signal and sit in a moment of optimism to embrace that and not think of an either or situation, you are then given an opportunity to reflect on the potential opportunity that might be there with that uncertainty. So, so that I think is all I was gonna say on that one. So I didn't know if anyone wanted to share in that since we've just talked on that. Suhan. Uh, in this context, um, are you making a distinction between uncertainty and ambiguity, or is it both? Like, I often think about how you need to be able to navigate both, um, and uh, yeah, just uh, keen to hear your thoughts. Oh, we're going to have to have a whole section on that. So, so I, I, I see them for the purposes of this. I'm seeing ambiguity within that. So that that idea that there is um, there is a moment where you are uncertain because of the ambiguity that is evident in what you are seeking to work with or make a decision about. But if if we get into the distinctions between um, the unknown, the ambiguous, the gray. The uncertain. So I'm so I'm thinking here just from the perspective of human behavior and dealing with with a, a very basic, um, if you like, divide between uh, what you are certain about and what you are not certain about. So on that. But if you can stay for lunch, that would be that would be great to get into. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, there's a question online. David, can you can you speak your question? I sure can. Thank you so much, Theresa. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Awesome. Um, just thinking about sitting in, sitting with uncertainty and then the next H you've got there, have hope and optimism. Mm -hmm. if, if you're sitting in un uncertainty and hoping that it's sort of going to be okay, how do you avoid disaster? Oh, oh, that's, Yeah. <laughs> I suppose the optimism is that you hope that you can avoid disaster. Um, I, I, I guess there in, and this, this comes back when I wrote about having hope and op optimism, I was thinking of some of the work of, of Ruth Crick and, and the ideas of appreciating that in order to navigate uncertain worlds you find that as a learner, if you can uh, suspend your fear or your concern that what you are going to do might lead to disaster, you open yourself to an opportunity to be able to think more freely about possibilities. So I think in practice, when you're dealing with decisions that you are held accountable for, you do have to think through the possible disasters. But um, with this, what I'm proposing, and I hope this is making sense, is that if you're going to see uncertainty as a potential signal for opportunity, you might put that concern about disaster to the to one side briefly, but annotate it. So, you know, remain aware of it. It's not about um, running blindly towards the cliff and saying, oh, I just hope that it's not as high a cliff as I thought it was. I'm, I'm talking into the air because I'm looking for David somewhere in the in the ether. Does that does that help? No, yeah, that that does make sense. I was just thinking, like, I I, I, mean, I don't want to set up like a dichotomy between optimism and pessimism or something like that. But I guess, yeah, having having um, a, a, an appetite for pessimism allows you to not not to say, oh, we can't do anything because 
it's going it's too risky but also to be able to say we know what the worst could be so let's avoid yeah. that you know yeah yeah. I, I think that's an excellent point. Thank you. And it is, it's always a challenge. Anytime you categorize, like I was saying, you know, we have, we have these false dichotomies, but, you know, I would argue that's also why we want diversity in our conversations and in our teams and in the different um, perspectives that we bring to something, because, you know, understanding what, what could go wrong and seeking to avoid it is a really powerful one. Um, and so maybe what it is, it's about allowing for both, both kinds of thinking. So can we can we suspend that and maybe have a conversation afterwards? I wish I wish you could join us for lunch, but we'll uh, we'll have a virtual. But thank you for the for the observation. I'm just looking at my watch, and I'm just going to not because the conversation is over, but I'm I'm you know I'm I'm a victim of structure here because we have to be out um, in a little over a half hour. So I want to I want to share action three, which kind of connects to what we were just talking about, and this is making green spaces for the mind. So if you're going to be able to think about both, both the potential disasters and also the potential opportunities and promises, you need to make time for your thinking. And again, one of the things that is really hard in, in our industries and in the ways that we are often expected to work in our organizations is you always are running out of time. You know, I love walking down the street, trying to get a bus and, you know, you're running, you don't have time you know, to, to see what's around you. Um, and, and so sometimes it does take a very deliberate act of making and creating a green space, a pause for your mind. And I think in information systems and working with data, this is particularly true. So I have here on the slide, this is a quote from one of my favorite information ethicists, someone who also worked with Jeff Bowker and Lee Starr. He uh, I've had the privilege of being able to, to actually work with him when I was on sabbatical um, in Washington. But he is an information, he's a thinker, an information ethicist, an information systems person, and a practicing Buddhist. And he has written some really lovely work about contemplative scholarship and the challenges of dealing with, when he wrote this in 2007, this particular work, we just had what for us today feel like primitive information systems. And even then you could see that we were losing the time to look and think at exactly a moment when we had these amazing computational tools that we could work with. Well, let's just fast forward to 2024 and how many more amazing tools we have and the conversations we could have about Gen AI and about ways that we might or might not work with some of those tools. Where is the time for us to look and to think and to explore? So we have to take that, we have to make that space, we have to give privilege to appreciate the invisible work that the pause gives us. And this is the kind of uncertainty to, to build on some of those earlier observ the questions with action two. There, there is real power in allowing us to think at the edge. So again, if I go back to some of the early work that I witnessed when I was watching scholars who were at a paradigmatic shift, they were creating the shifts. And so often when they were trying to find information that would help them or that they could rule out, the most exciting moments for them, um, which you don't necessarily know at the time, but you know in hindsight when you're looking at them, is when, when they hit an edge, when they hit some point where there's difference, where it isn't corresponding with what they know, but it's not so left of field that you can't connect to it. But you don't have the words to work out how to move there. That's the edge. That's the kind of edge. So you need time and space to be thinking at that edge, to be, first of all, privileging your own individual reflection, and then sitting in a moment where you can start to language it. And the language, we could have a whole conversation about whether or not language would constrain us. But you know, as human beings, whether, whether you use words or images or movement, you're thinking about how to communicate an idea that you have, an experience that you have, to yourself and then to others. So, so that's one aspect. And the other thing that I would say on this that I think is really important and that I think we sometimes um, do not give sufficient respect to, and that is the power of intuitive judgments. And again, I'm looking over at Suhan, I can remember early on 10 years ago when we were talking about you know, the judgments and the, 
and the way that a data scientist might sit in a C-suite meeting with a board and have seen something in the data that you're, you're trying to help convince this group of, of non-technical people is important and trying to take on. And there are moments where you, you just know, <laughs> you know what you're seeing and you have this insight. And I think that's an incredibly powerful human capacity for drawing on insight. I, I say often, I said it in classrooms and I say it, you know, I'm reflecting, I try to remind myself I do know something. Um, we as humans are amazing recording devices. We collect so much, and, but we need to make time to be able to do that sense-making work. And so if instead of dismissing it as not objective, if we could find ways, and I like to think that that is an important part of the ethical intention, when you respect your own intuitive judgments, not because you're going to say, oh, you know, for that reason, I'm not going to pay respect to what the data is saying. But when you give yourself some time to think about why you have that gut reaction, that I think is what helps you to work out that whole cool or creepy notion. You know, why, why am I so uncomfortable doing this? What is it that this is signaling or what is it that this is missing? And so I think Giving yourself time to think is a really powerful way of trying to become clear in your mind what it is that you see as good, what you see as ethical, um, and how to language that and evidence that in, a, in your work and in your actions as a citizen of the world. So that involves developing a stillness so that you can make sense of what is seen and not seen, to remain alert for things that might be missing or hidden or incomprehensible. And you can do it you know, on a daily basis just by building quick pauses. I know an hour and a half, someone knows, it's kind of hard. I, I, I usually love to find a way to have us all meditate and that may not work today. But doing breath work or reflective writing, helping yourself or painting, whatever it is that helps you to language this. And then also sitting in place and just being in place. Could someone just hit that green button, please? And let Rick back in. So. And this picture here I took when I was sitting in place. I was actually standing in place because I was in the middle of a lagoon um, at low tide in a coral reef. And I went out and I just stood. And first, it's a magical thing to be in a coral reef and to just see this amazing life beneath the surface and appreciate it above as well. So that idea of making the invisible visible becomes clear. But it's in the stillness of sitting there and not moving that more and more of that space revealed itself. Because when I stop moving, then the little fish start coming by. And then the current starts going back to a reaction of my legs where they are. The sands were shifting and moving because the tide's constantly going. And you start, the more I looked, the more I saw, the more the colors became clear. So I know that's a very physical sitting in place. But I think it, it, it is a practice that I would encourage us all to do to just be minded of the spaces in which we are sitting and working and being, because it then has this knock on effect of helping us to develop that capacity with our mind to be able to see differently. So um, I do have a little time if anyone wants to share something about that or some technique. I love your nodding, Matt. I... So many questions. Yeah, here's one. Um, just the tension on making time, you know, the balance between Kronos and Kairos time. But when you're working in an organization and you've got all this functional stress, you've got your KPIs, how do you navigate that tension and how do you justify maybe to your superiors um, that there's this extraordinary benefit that comes from those, you know, green spaces for the mind? Yeah, this is, this is absolutely, thank you. Um, because I think this is where we as individuals and as a community should be voicing this and flagging that this, this is not an optional extra. This is essential. This, it isn't the either or between having those KPIs which supposedly measure performance. It's about saying we need some new KPIs. And maybe the KPI, we joked at one point, um, Kailash and I, we were gonna put in a different KPI to the university that was about how much uncertainty have you experienced? The problem is measuring it, you know? Now, does it need to be measured? Or should you be respected for finding ways to break new ground and for arguing that? And I, and I think this is, this is, 
this is what troubles me in organizations. And I know I have the evidence. You know, I'm a doctor of uncertainty. I can see it. And, and, and we've all experienced this. So how and why, this is also why I'm passionate about working with practitioners at that level and getting, helping us all to have the voice and the courage to go and say, no, that's all good. And so it's not the but, it's the and. And we can do so much more with this. And also why it's so important to build community so that you go, am I crazy or does this work? Um, Ian McGilchrist, uh, who wrote The Master and His Emissary, talks about re and then his, his, his current book, The Matter With Things, calls for reinstating intuition and imagination as missing elements that have been erased by science and reason. So he calls it you know, science and reason, yes, but the neuroscience is in. Intuition and imagination are not just fluffy new age things. And um, that reintegration is what you're talking about, I think. And there's, it's increasingly grounded in, in neuroscience for the people who are going to be convinced by neuroscience. Uh, and data science, you know, intuition and imagination is what you're calling for here and knowing how to tap into that. And that's not necessarily the, the same mode or way of thinking about something that you do when you're just being technical, rational, scientific. Thank you. And again, I'm, I'm looking at the, the clock only because this is this is the magic stuff. It's that point because you know, we have lunch because it's it should not be the either or. And there are cultures where it isn't an either or. You just are, and you know time changes based on the ground reality of where you are at that moment. It's it's just an I and it really worries me because I feel like we've and technology seems to be privileging that that plan pressure side at the expense of the pause and the play that is so much a part of what helps us to be joyful and to be our best selves so that we can bring the best ideas to the to the world we're trying to build you know it's so i i i would just like to see us do more of that uh and you know go back i mean i when i grew up i mean there was a mystic that we used to draw on in my family and you know we're talking you know human spirit here so Srila, um, I just wanted to add to that point about either or and, and science and creativity and working together. Uh, oftentimes what happens is um, people put themselves in a particular bracket or a discipline and say, you know, this is what, this is the role of a programmer and my role is simply to code the system or to, to develop it. And there's someone else who's probably going to look at the ethics side and this is where the ethicist comes in. And this is where the real conflict begins, right? It's not, it's not a real um, collaboration happening or, or of one person. It's not a one person's job. Um, and I was wondering if you have any practical instances of how people can work together, given that they do have some technical expertise or disciplinary expertise, but practices where they can come together. And I know this is where at UTS we have, we sit in TD school and we talk about transdisciplinary practice, but how does this apply um, in the real world with data in particular to work in teams? Thank you for that question. Again, that's let's talk at lunch and, and strategize on this because I think I think it has to happen from both above and below. So I think again, it's about empowering an individual to say, I have a talent to offer you, but here's another way that if you, dear organization, would like to keep me, you know, I would like to be able to contribute. And some organizations do that very well by building communities of practice or finding ways to create informal networks. Um, but it worries me that so much of that is is down to the individual being proactive about that. There are organizations and it's it seems harder the larger they get because structure is how, you know, the accounting that has to be done to make sure people get paid and the categorization. I know I, I feel this because, you know, before the label transdisciplinary existed at UTS in a formal way, um, the departments that I was in and the kind of work that I did did not conform to labels. And I lost grants because they said, well, like in one case, I remember they said, well, you're doing IT work, but you're not in the IT faculty. So therefore you can't get that. You go, oh, okay, that's good. You're still looking at humans. Hmm, okay. Um, and, and, and that's just down to like regulation can't keep up, structure can't keep up. And it's the, the structures that have been privileged so that's, again, that idea of challenging those boundaries and questioning them. 
And I want to I want to jump because I think there's a there there are things that we can do. But in the first instance, what I would say is, is when you sit in silence and you sit in place and you think about what makes your heart sing and what is important and what you would like to contribute, whether it's to your organization or it's through some external activity, I think it's important to think of that as the, the, the contribution. And all of that relates to data because it's about the world that that data is intended to represent. I know that's shorthanded and, and quip. I'm just, I'm just conscious I wanna get to my, my seven. So the nurturing personal and collective creativity is, is basically an extension of you know, the thinking that you're doing and the pauses that you're taking. And then finding ways to slow down your thinking and tap into that felt sense. And this is just one illustration of the different ways we used to do this with students in class. Um, I think it was after working with your crew, um, Matt, to sort of think about ways, ways to offer structure but not structure. Because so often when you're trying to introduce someone to a new way of thinking, if it's too new, it's just, it, it can't compute. But just finding little mechanisms for um, on your own, but then also with like-minded people that you find through a community like this or in a workplace or through some interest group. And it relates, so action five, so the, the last ones are very much about um, stepping out of our individual practice and finding ways that we can build the world differently and um, disrupt inequities and injustices where we see them. So, you know, I'm very proud to have been a woman in data science. I guess I'm still a woman in data science, but to have been parts of organizations where we really worked very hard to change the application structure, for instance, for the MDSI, to recognize some of the inequities that were unconscious biases. So one of the mantras, the work that I've been very fortunate to do with colleagues Katina Waite and Mukti Bawa, 12 years ago, we looked at curricula and ways that we could introduce practices in the classroom to disrupt big, loud, and first, to help people to see beyond those biases that were not necessarily foregrounded. And I think that heuristic of disrupting big, loud, and first, I used to love it in class sometimes, you know, I'd listen in on groups and someone would say, oh, you know, X, you're being a little big, loud, and first right now. So, you know, it's just being minded as an individual that, okay, let me look out. And I'm often big, loud, and first. So I try to step back as well. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a small, in the research that we did, we were amazed that how such a small tactic, how a seemingly simple heuristic can have really powerful impacts, not just in the classroom, but in the workplace. So just being aware of the consequences of being the first in and the kinds of techniques. So brainstorming, for instance, really privileges the big loud and first, but allowing moments to sit in your own thoughts and to then perhaps write those thoughts down, particularly if English is not your first language, that's really important. And then conferring with one other person. We used to call it the think, pair, share. So that you slow down the ideation work. It's not that you're not doing it, but this comes back to that observation before about time and about taking back time and saying there is value in this. Um, and we'll change the KPIs to show that. So it's also connected, and I see this, I wanna share this story. I posted it in LinkedIn last year for International Women's Day, but to me, it's a really important action to bring into this. And that's about creating opportunities to break the cycles of disadvantage. So I have this little medal by my desk, so I see it every day. And it is, it is the one and only science medal I won. I, um, as a young girl, 14 years old, I wanted nothing other than to be an atmospheric physicist. That was just, that was gonna be the end all. And I did a science project that involved um, creating a pattern matching system to understand what was happening with the clouds in a way that you could then use that to predict weather. Um, and it was very analog and, and you know, my past self was, I suddenly realized being very ethnographic in a scientific way. So, so anyway, so I, did this for about six months and then I came up with this pattern matching system and I, I displayed it at a science fair. It was a big science fair in our state and I won. I won the grand prize. But now this surprised the organizers because first off, 14-year-olds weren't supposed to win um, and I did. 
And so they went to my parents and they said, well, normally the prize, the grand prize winner gets sent to a national competition to share their work. But they said this year they won't do that. And they told my parents it's because, well, she's a 14 year old and, you know, we're worried about a young girl. You know, you think about that, the Olympics, there was that concern about 14 year old competitors and they're in this big world of high school kids. Whoa. Um, and so they said, well, we won't do that this year. You know, we didn't know any better. Uh, only about three months later, I ran into a 14 year old boy who won a competition at a nearby state and he got sent to the nationals. So, you know, 14 year old boys apparently were capable of handling the big wide world, but 14 year old girls were not. And then a few months after that, I actually was told by some people that the problem wasn't so much that I was just a 14 year old girl, but I was a girl who didn't speak English as a first language. And I came from a high school that no one in the state really thought produced anybody that would amount to much. They certainly weren't scholarly enough to invest this kind of time and effort in. Luckily, I didn't know that at the time because what happened at that event, and I get goosebumps just thinking about it, which is why I have the medal up there. Some of the judges, and they were all male judges because there were no female science judges for our competition. But some of those men felt that that was unjust. They could see what was happening. So what they did was come up with some mentoring programs for me. And I got, because I was doing weather, I got exclusive access and I got that for two and a half years to go to the American Meteorological Society meetings in Washington, DC to sit with these scientists. They set up curated mentorship programs where I got to go out and meet with scientists and talk about my work and learn about those different aspects. And they checked in on me on a regular basis. Now, that was not part of the formal award ceremony. And they didn't tell me, you know, it was accidental that I found out what shaped their decisions. Okay, and I'm glad I didn't know. I'm glad my parents didn't know as migrants what judgments were being made. But I will not forget that. And what I will not forget is how those individuals decided to create an opportunity to break a cycle of disadvantage. So now what I seek to do and what I would like to encourage all of you to do is to use you know, your, your marzipan eyes, like we talk about the other one, you know, breaking through layers. Think about different ways that you can create opportunity, either through an idea that you open up an opportunity for, or I would say it really starts with individuals. We have so much richness you know, to go to that idea of how people are constrained by the categories, by the labels that they have in an organization or the labels that are given to children in, in different schools. I mean, that 14 year old girl, if, if those men had not stood up and said, you know, this is unjust. And they, you know, it's interesting you think about in the seventies, they probably didn't feel that they could call it out publicly. Um, might be different these days with social media, but what really mattered was, you know, they weren't changing the world, but they changed the life of, in that instance, me and knowing those kinds of people were probably not just doing it for one person, they were looking at regularly. So it strikes me that that's a, re a really important exercise for us to do, to find, ooh, to find ways to open the doors for collaboration and connection, to find ways to support, to find ways to language when we need support, when you need someone to, to um, assist, to be alert for the missing, the misrepresented and the underrepresented, to be open to what is possible, to think about the spheres of influence that you have and to create safe spaces for those trusted, open and frank conversations. And that leads me to the final one, which is about finding ways to design with people and not simply for them. Participatory design isn't just, you know, here are these actions that you do. It is very much about opening yourself to the uncertainty of working with people who have the audacity to be delightfully human and uncertain. And it means changing different time frames sometimes. But I think when we're working with data, when we're working with information, when we're working with systems and structure, it is vital that we are putting into practice, you know, these eyes that are looking for what is missing, misrepresented, underrepresented, and we're looking for ways to ensure that we create those practices that are truly participatory. 
And so the last story I'll tell is around this article from 2016 by Jared Thorpe, where he talks about a high school in New York that was labeled through sentiment analysis that a research organization did. It was labeled the saddest place in New York. And there was a big New York Times story about it and the kids all go to school and they see that they're labeled the saddest place in New York. Apart from the horror of thinking about adolescence, you know, given what we know about you know, youth suicide, to think that there's this big media report saying these kids are you know, really sad, what's going on in this school? Well, it turns out it was just really bad science. It was really bad data analysis. And it was done without context and without appreciation because the kids, you know, they, the language was misinterpreted and the context was not there. But as Jarrah says, and it's a really nice little piece in, um, in Medium, he says, it's a world that flows in one direction. Data so often comes from us, but it rarely returns to us. And in the case of those high school students, that was particularly, they, no one asked them if they thought that the data that had been collected about them actually meant what these analysis thought it did. So data is not collected for, in this case, high school students, but for the people who want to know how high school students feel. Now, the best way to find out how people feel is to talk to them. And if you're trying to create, which I think we are, we're aspiring to create systems that support the well-being of our communities, well, then our communities need to be in there. And I think in organizations, it also means ensuring that you are bringing people in throughout the organization who have those different insights. And Shabani, that goes to your observation then too, getting, getting the multiple voices from in an organization, but then also privileging the opportunity to engage with lots of different levels of community people. And that again means a different measure of time to do that. So I've sought to do that in the methodology that I use in stepping stones um, or connecting stones of so the stepping stones for my connecting stones. And I'm gonna tell you why I call it connecting stones in a minute. Because I also think that it's important that we don't just jump in to co-design and invite people to participate in our feedback sessions. Because to get genuine, authentic, trusted feedback, you have to demonstrate you are worthy of trust. And you have to demonstrate that you are going to respect what is provided to you by the people that you are asking to give of their time. And so a really important first step, a critical step that I don't think is, is um, and my colleague Ruth Marshall and I work quite a lot on this, really important is to first establish the legitimacy of what you are doing. Establish that you are the right person or the right organization to be able to go in and try to design what it is that you're seeking to do. Work towards acceptance by recognizing holistically whole life cycles of design and practice and the life cycle of data and use that to establish your credibility by building in mechanisms for feedback, bi-directional feedback, um, participation and being very transparent about decisions that you've made and gaps that you might see as well. And your uncertainties, it goes to showing what you don't know revealing that, being honest. And through that, you gain and maintain trust. And ultimately, I think that opens the door for true participatory, meaningful engagement as a co-design process. So I've shared that. And again, it'll be in the link, um, one of the most recent publications that I did um, that shared the collaboration with New South Wales government and looks at ways of taking these design practices into the future. So those are the seven actions. And I thought I'd close with explaining why I call my company Connecting Stones. So there's, there's two ways, but I'm gonna share the one. And Simon got it in one without me even having to say. So does anyone here know the um, fable of the Portuguese uh, story of stone soup? No, okay, so that gives me a chance to, to, to just share it in brief. So, so this is um, a fable that, that I've long loved. And it's about, it takes place in a time of great distrust. Um, community disharmony um, and you know a troubled society. Kind of sounds like something we can all relate to right now. So in the midst of all of this, so neighbors aren't talking to one another, they're staying in their houses and they're just not sharing. And all of a sudden in the village green show pops up a wandering minstrel who sets up camp and he puts a big cauldron out and he starts boiling water. So now people are really curious, what is going on? You know, why is this person come into our space and what is he doing here? 
So one by one, because they're not going to talk to one another, one by one, they go up to him and they're asking him what he's doing. He says, oh, well, you know, I'm going to make stone soup. Stone soup? What is that? You haven't had stone soup? It's just the most amazing soup. And if you've never tried it, well, you should really try. Well, I haven't tried it. I'd like to try it. I'm not sure I'm going to have enough. Well, the first person says he's got some carrots. He could bring some carrots. Would that extend the soup? Yeah, yeah, we could make it go longer. You know where I'm going now. Another person comes up, he's got some potatoes. Another person has a turnip. Someone else has herbs in their garden. And so before you know it, all these people in this town, this village, who have not been making time for one another, who have been very distrustworthy, are all circled around this cauldron that is now smelling fantastic because I don't know if you like soup, but you know, you put all these ingredients together, it's gonna, it's gonna be very nice. And so now he's waiting, so the time is right. So he takes out this lovingly cared for stone, this magic stone that makes the soup and he puts it into the pot and everyone agrees it's by far the best soup that they've ever had. Now what made that soup, I think, and that's the moral of the story is not the stone, but the magic of community. And it's about connecting and making time to sit with one another and to be communal. And so to me, that is why connecting stones is, is the moral that I, I like to take in. Um, the other reason connecting stones is to honor a Zimbabwean phrase um, that says, you can stumble over many a stone and still climb a mountain. And I feel like you connect those stones as you climb and you get there. So now it's over to you. The stones have been dropped. Here are the seven actions. And I really thank you for listening, for being there virtually as well. I know you can't see me looking up at the heavens, but thank you, virtual audience, and thank you, community. And um, I guess we have a little time for questions here, but then I, I hope that you will share, not stone soup, but share a meal together and sit and talk. And this is the beginning and not the end. I'd love to stay connected and, and engage with us. So thank you. Five minutes for some questions. Anyone want the mic? I'll put the seven. So, so I'll share. I'll share those links around. They're all publicly available papers. Um, but those are the seven actions. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Teresa. That was really inspiring and and wonderful to see uh, so much humanity. Uh, coming out in these ideas with with what we need, and I think there's never been a time in history where we where we really really need uh, this type of thinking about technology and information and data. And uh, just on the point of uh, imagination, um, our moral imagination, our ability to uh, infer moral values and the things that we truly stand for and care for from metaphor, from story, from song, from artwork is something that we're, we're lacking in society. And I guess um, a core to so much of my work is, is how you bring that and, and likewise with yours, how coming back to this tension point within an organizational context, where you've got this kind of mentalities and value systems around, you know, making money, you've got this kind of primary logic that flows down through the organization. Um, but to the time tension where it's like move fast and break things versus uh, find time for pause and nurture and cultivate things. Um, like how, how, do, how do we really navigate that as practitioners, as organizations, as companies, as society? It's a big question. So we'll answer that in two minutes, right? No, no. Um, no, it, this, is, this is what, yeah, we'll carry on there. This is what breaks my heart is how hard it is to do that. So I feel very fortunate that I'm at a stage, you know, what is it one says in the sunset of my years or whatever, not quite the sunset of my years, but, but I was at a stage where after 24 years at a university, I could say, no, no, what I want to do, what makes me want to get up doesn't fit with this structure. But I also know I could do that because I wasn't trying to put any kids through university. My parents had passed, so I didn't have those obligations. I could suddenly, and also to be honest, it's because of my parents passing and the legacy of, of their, for anyone who hasn't heard, so my parents are um, 
I'm a child of the diaspora of Central Europe and the end of World War II. And it felt important to honor what they had suffered and sacrificed. And I needed to not leave this earth without doing that. And I felt I had opportunity, but I'm not under any illusion that the only reason I could make that decision is because I sit in Australia in a system where I had a social network that meant that if I left my job, I would not be without health insurance. It, it troubles me how that, that more than anything helped me to do that. And it shouldn't be that way. But in the meantime, <laughs> the hope and optimism part of me says, what I can do is try to talk and help people to find one another so that you start to connect and you make those links between so that in the first instance you develop, and I use this metaphor of an inoculation, you know, to inoculate yourself against some of those pressures where possible and possibly sow the seeds for doing different in the first instance in your day to day, but then maybe over time finding ways to connect in an entrepreneurial fashion to change those. Because again, just like the disrupting those cycles of disadvantage, the only way we're going to start to do those changes is if we can just make those small little stepping stones. So we have a huge mountain to climb, but we gotta start somewhere and see that. But thank you so much. That's. Uh, and do it together. Absolutely. That's a really big part. Thank you. Anyone else want the mic? I really like that last question. I just want to say one of the things that's, as you know, I quite like everything you say. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, hey, we have a world which is constructed to, to do put in our mind the opposite of what Therese is talking about. So I think your question is, how do we do that? And I am I could talk, because I work in the corporate world, and it's really fucking ugly. And um, and so how do I survive? And it's, it's connecting up with people. We go, I go bush regularly, which is really important. But I'm also inspired. One of the things, but I also think we need to be brave. And the, 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 the power structures in society all around of liberal democratic societies, particularly the colonial structures, are breaking down. And and we're at the beginning of that. We can't see it. So my answer, one of the as you were talking, one of the things I was thinking is I was really inspired by the occupied saying of if you're looking for a leader, look in the mirror. If you look long enough, your leader will appear. That was fantastic, Theresa. Thank you very much. That was just really, really inspirational. Um, I just had a question on dealing with uncertainties because, I mean, you say that the way to go through it is through having open and honest conversation with trusted relationships. Often when you are um, doing a project, especially nowadays, your teammates are working remotely. So it's really hard to build that trust and then when you come to something that you don't know, there is this kind of fear and panic of saying, hey, this is what I found because you don't want to be seen as not, not knowing what you're doing, right? So what are your tips of, of building those trusted relationships with the teams? Monica, thank you. That is a fabulous question because that, that isn't easy. And that's, that's the art of connecting with people. And again, it, it, goes against the way a lot of those remote conversations are often set up because people are moving from, you know, one meeting to the next with maybe five or 10 minutes in between. Um, and it's difficult, but what I would suggest in the first instance is have, a, have regular conversations with yourself about your uncertainty. Learn to trust yourself to have an open and frank conversation without penalty and without consequence. So I'm a big believer in sort of free writing. And you know, even if you, if you have children, burn the book, don't let them ever see it. You know, that's one of the, the rules there. But it's that idea of learning to language it so that um, you feel comfortable then when, it, when there is an opportunity to share with others, you've at least also made time to share with yourself. That's something that we often miss. But then the other thing, and, I, and I, I speak this from personal experience. So two of the closest friends that I have now, I met remotely through COVID. 
They were in different parts of the world and they are like sisters to me. And that happened first off, again, I was privileged to work on topics where we shared that passion, but also we found ways to just have social time together. So before you start sharing professional doubts, you get to know the individual just as you would in face to face. It's, it's you know, you, you don't just jump up to someone and say, okay, so now we're gonna build this thing together. And you say, oh, you know, hello, what's your name? You know, <laughs> you know and that's hard when online makes that so difficult. Again, it privileges the pressure and it privileges the plan. The other thing I would say, and this is again, you know, I, I write about this so I don't mind sharing it. So one of the things that invited me to start worrying less about the consequences was when I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And I was diagnosed with a brain tumor just at about the time I was looking at the data from my PhD and seeing the value of uncertainty. And I was sitting in my brain surgeon's office and he said, you know, how we move forward with your treatment depends on how you feel about uncertainty and risk. And I said, well, it's interesting you should say that, you know, because I'm kind of living that and I'm trying to write about that theoretically. And so in the first instance, what that said to me is this cannot just be theory. This has to be my lived experience. But the other thing I realized is I kind of know what's going to kill me. And sharing with other people is not one of them. And that for, for me, because I was, I, you know, again, English wasn't my first language. I was always weird as an academic, you know, I'd been bullied before that academically. But now all of a sudden I thought, where's the harm? So I actually wrote, I didn't, I didn't say, hello, you know, my name is Trace, I have a brain tumor. But I, but I put down on paper the ideas I had and where I thought they should go. And I haven't looked back since then. Now, I'm not saying that that happens for everyone, but because it's, it's how you feel individually about what it is that you can tolerate in terms of that unknown and the position that you have and the concerns that you have. But sitting with that and making that, that conscious decision about where you move forward is, is very liberating to sort of think about what you value and what you'd like to do. And that will also allow you, if I can sound you know, very human and very mothering there, is it lets you be your genuine best self which is what's also gonna help you to connect with those, those people that you haven't seen. It's how, for instance, we had one of our first fabulous face-to-face -face conversations, but it's that sense of not worrying about being from one department or another or having to represent something. It's just being you and being that. And I think if we all start practicing that, that becomes the new norm. So again, full disclosure, I can say that because I don't work in an organization, you know, I like my boss, you know, so it's, that's the benefit of working for yourself. But thank you for that. And I can see, see, we're out of time, but can we please go to lunch? And can I thank the virtual people if they're still there as well? Okay, so this is why we have Teresa Anderson back here. This, the stories, the compassion, the case studies, the rigor. Teresa, thank you again very much indeed. And if you can, please come over to the cafe over there. We've got an area reserved for those who want to hang out and meet each other and talk further. Bring your own stones. Bring your stones. Okay. Thanks very much, Scott, for AV.